What comes to mind with the word disciple? The Twelve Apostles? A learner. A follower. Living Truth takes to the streets to ask, what is a disciple? Well, um, obviously the disciple Jesus is disciples. Not that I could list them all. Um, and Judas, who was the bad disciple. Nowadays, a disciple would just be a follower. It depends, because I'm from a very different culture, right? For us, um, I'm from a Sikh background. For me, uh, my Holy Bible, we run out is everything. So we don't go by people, we go by what is written in the Bible. Well, the disciple would be the student. But it depends who's the teacher. A follower. Um, I think of religious, obviously, the disciples of Jesus. Um, but I mean, it has a broader meaning of, of anybody who's a follower. Jesus and the 12 disciples. Yeah, so I think that's a, what it means to me. It's like you have a, like, like someone that knows a lot about something and you will follow that type of teaching. To somebody who's not very religious, I guess somebody who's a part of the original following of a church that is formed. Yeah, I guess they asked you to willingness to learn. Somebody who's trying to learn from some... It's, uh, I don't know, really. <laughs> I think you're asking the wrong person. I think a disciple is somebody who follows, it's usually in a religious sense, somebody who follows a certain religion. On today's program, Charles Price explains what a disciple is. He begins a new series, The Growth of a Disciple. Part 1, Timothy's Conversion. Now let me read to you from Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read the first three verses, which introduce us to a young man called Timothy. And you'll see in a few minutes why I am reading this. This comes during Paul's second missionary journey. And it says he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. And Lystra, by the way, is in Turkey, so neither of them are on their home territory. But it was a mixed marriage. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Then if you jump over to 2 Timothy, the last of Paul's 13 letters, and I want to just read a few verses there from the first chapter, where Paul is now an old man, and Timothy is in Ephesus, where he is leading the church there. And Paul writes this second letter to him, saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. What comes to mind when I use the word disciple? What does that word conjure up? Well, I, I think for some of us it will conjure up in our minds the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles of Jesus. Maybe you think of some figures in a stained glass window with a halo around their head, 
Maybe you think of a learner, which is the literal meaning of the word disciple, sitting at the feet of a teacher. You might even think to call somebody a disciple is bordering on being a little fanatical, maybe over the top. But I wonder how many of us, when I asked you what you thought of when you hear the word disciple, thought immediately of yourself. If I said to you, what is a disciple, what do you say? That's very simple. I am one. Because actually, that is what our business is about here this morning. Before the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, he gave his disciples their marching orders, so to speak. And he did that on several occasions, said slightly different things on each occasion. But he said in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's your job, he says, make disciples. Not collect decisions, a decision, a moment at which you say yes to Jesus Christ. It's vital, of course, but that isn't the object. That may be a necessary means. Not go and make members of your church. Not go and get people into heaven by the skin of their teeth, but with very little expectation of change here and now in this life. Go, he says, and make disciples of all nations. And therefore, we have to ask the important question, what does it mean to make a disciple? If we don't know what that means, we actually don't know what we're doing here this morning. Because that is why we're here. Now, for a number of weeks, I've talked about the church and how that uh, men and women, boys and girls, are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He's the head, and we're members of that body. His Spirit is the life and energy of that body. And we've talked about this over a number of weeks. And we were talking then about the corporate nature of believers together in that one body. But if the church is corporate, it is made up of individual disciples. And so I thought it would be valuable to take just a few weeks to look at a case history of a disciple and in so doing define what a disciple is. And I think the best way to do that is rather than talking in sort of abstract or propositional terms, talk in terms of a living person who has had to come into that relationship with Jesus Christ that has not just forgiven them of their past, but equipped them here and now to live a life that is effective and fruitful, which is what discipleship is going to involve. And the case history is this young man, Timothy, young for much of what we know about him in the New Testament, and one of the famous discipling relationships in the New Testament is, of course, that of Paul and Timothy. Their relationship began on Paul's first missionary journey. We'll talk about that in a moment. And goes right through to the very last letter Paul wrote when he was waiting and expecting to die, the letter of 2 Timothy, when he was an old man. And Timothy by then was probably middle years. But the beginning of their relationship would have been when Timothy was very young. And I'm calling this the growth of a disciple. And over several weeks, I want to look at Timothy as an example of what makes a disciple. What is a disciple? What makes a disciple? What can a disciple expect his or her life to include? Let me summarize what we know of Timothy in a nutshell. He's not mentioned until Paul's second missionary journey when he came to Lystra, and he's described there as being a disciple, and it's very likely that he was actually converted when Paul came to Lystra on his first missionary journey a little over a year before. The reason why I say that is because several times Paul speaks of Timothy as my son in the faith, or similar words. And that would indicate that Paul saw Timothy as a young man that he had led to Christ and therefore his son in the faith. And on the second missionary journey that he went on, he picked him up in Lystra, took him on the rest of that journey. When it came to Paul's third missionary journey, he sent Timothy ahead of him to Philippi to do some things with the believers there. And then he sent him to Thessalonica. Then he sent him to Corinth. And finally, he sent him to Ephesus, where he is when Paul wrote two letters to him. The first letter, 1 Timothy, is a letter about how to manage the church. 
He explains that, how people ought to conduct themselves in the church of the living God. And he explains lots of things about managing the church. Second Timothy is about managing himself. Okay, Timothy, you're the pastor of the church in Ephesus. It's one thing to manage the church, it's another thing to manage yourself. Every church should know something about First Timothy. Every pastor, but I won't limit it to that, every Christian should know something about Second Timothy, where he talks about, hey, don't be timid, don't be ashamed, be prepared to suffer, be like a soldier, be like an athlete, be like a farmer. And then he says, when he's given them that high list of things, wow, that is out of my debt. Says, but remember, Jesus Christ risen from the dead, and Jesus Christ is your strength for all of this. That's the summary of Second Timothy. Now, we therefore have a lot of information about Timothy that helps us to piece together and in some ways to reconstruct something of Timothy's life in order to help us understand what it means to be a real disciple and to grow as a disciple. And this morning I want to just talk about two things, about his circumstances and then we'll talk about his conversion. Regarding his circumstances, he came from a mixed family in two ways. Ethnically, he was mixed because his father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew. Now, I think it's interesting they live in Turkey. You may know that the Jews and Gentiles did not get on. And for his mother to marry a Gentile would be perceived as being a, an equal marriage. And probably there was some ostracism that came because of that. So they were mixed from their ethnic background, but it was a mixed family also because his mother was a believer. And the likely inference from what Paul says is that his father was not. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. And it's very significant, he does not mention his father as having a sincere faith. Probably because his father didn't. And so, the likelihood is that Timothy is not just in a mixed family, a Jewish mother and a Gentile Greek father, but also it was mixed spiritually in that his mother was a Christian, his grandmother was a Christian, but his father was not. And so he grew up with all the tensions that that would imply. Tensions that some of you know a very lot about. Maybe from a racially mixed marriage, you know, the ostracism that that sometimes can lead to, as it probably did to Timothy. From a spiritually mixed family, where maybe one parent is a believer and the other is not. And maybe you are the believing parent in a marriage with children. And the difficulty and the hardship of seeking to convey to your child or your children the gospel of Jesus Christ whilst your husband or your wife is antagonistic towards that. Eunice, his mother, loved the Lord as did his grandmother Lois and she was very careful to teach Timothy scripture from the time he was a child because Paul refers to that in 2 Timothy 3.15. He, he says, How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Although your husband did not cooperate in this, I know Eunice has taught you the Word of God. And notice also the grandmother. That is important too. That's a great role grandparents can have. Putting our children in Sunday school is very important, but it's not enough. We need to be reading the Word of God to them, teaching the Word of God to our children. Now, how you do that in your family is something you have to work out with your family timetable. But spending time when you pray together and you read the Scriptures together when they're young is vitally important to embed the Word of God into their hearts. Gypsy Smith was an evangelist, very famous evangelist in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, when I was young, I read his autobiography. It had a big impact on me. But he told the story how that when he was uh, 
preaching somewhere, a lady came to him and told him that she wanted to be a missionary, but she had six children. So it's going to be very difficult for her. And Gypsy Smith said to her, that is absolutely fantastic. Not only has God called you to be a missionary, but he has given you a mission field without having to leave home. And so it is. If God has given you children, he has given you a mission field right in your home. One day, when there comes a moment of harvesting, what you harvest is the seed that has been sown. Resist the temptation to bring about premature new birth by forcing the issue. And children, of course, are very vulnerable. So just be careful of forcing the issue. I know out of good motives sometimes we say, just pray the prayer. Give God his time to work in their hearts to reveal to them themselves and Christ in a way that they know they need to come to know him for themselves. But one of the very important roles of Christian parents and Christian grandparents modeled here by Timothy's grandmother is to teach the Word of God to our young children. And this would have played a vital role in why it was that he was converted when he was. He had roots into the Word of God. Let me talk secondly about his conversion. Because, uh, as I mentioned just now, Timothy is mentioned first in Acts 16 when Paul sets off on his missionary journey. But because he had been to Lystra on a previous visit, calls him Timothy, my son in the Lord, or my son in the faith, we can fairly confidently conclude that Paul had led him to Christ. He'd grown up with a believing mother and a believing grandmother, but there comes a time when often somebody new comes into the scene. Not with a new message, but somebody fresh that enables us to think freshly about it again. And that seems to have happened here. And the circumstances in which Timothy would have been converted on that first visit to Lystra are very interesting. In fact, they're very dramatic. Paul wrote to Timothy later in 2 Timothy 3, and he said, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. I'd love to preach a series on each of those words sometime. Paul says, Timothy, you, you've seen all these things. And then he says, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. In other words, he says, Timothy, you know all about me, and there are various ways in which you've learned all these things about me, but you remember what happened in Lystra? You'll find it in Acts chapter 14. You can read it sometime. Let me tell you the story. When Paul came into Lystra with Barnabas for the first time, they didn't know any believers there, and they met a man who was crippled from birth. And under Paul's ministry to him, he was supernaturally healed. He jumped up, began to walk and run all over the place, and the crowds went wild. And the crowds gathered around and began to say, the gods have come down to us in human form. Because they knew this man that had seen him on the streets ever since his birth. The gods have come down. And they made garlands and wreaths, and they took bulls to sacrifice to them, and they gave Barnabas the name Zeus, one of their gods. They gave Paul the name Hermas, one of their gods. They said they gave him that name because he was the chief speaker, so Hermas would have had something to do with oratory and speaking. And Paul and Barnabas swept into this euphoric response and this deifying of them, got up, and Paul said, Stop! We are only men. We are human like you. In other words, stop this nonsense. And then he said this, We came to bring you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things, these offering of bulls and sacrifice and so on to gods that don't exist. And then he took time to explain this. And following his explanation, you have the biggest pendulum swing in history. Because on the one hand, they were saying, You're like gods and we want to worship you. But some men came down from Antioch, where Paul had been just shortly before, and they told the crowd, don't you trust these men? These men are out to corrupt you. And the pendulum swung from calling them gods to them wanting to kill them. And they stoned Paul, and they stoned him until they thought he was dead. They left him on the ground, 
in a pool of his own blood, inevitably, because stoning is brutal, with broken bones, swollen eyes, no doubt, unconscious, assumed to be dead, and in due course, Paul came around, got up, and it says he went back into the city. Where did he go? We don't know, of course. But if Eunice and her mother Lois in the city were some of the early believers, and Paul had made their acquaintance, he might well have gone to find some refuge in their home. If I was Paul, I would have got up and gone the other way, by the way. He went back into the city. And I can imagine him, and this is just a reconstruction that may or may not be true, but I suggest it to you. He went back into the city, found these believers, found Eunice in her home. He's battered. He's bruised. Bones are broken. He's bleeding. His eyes probably puffy, swollen. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, would you like to be a disciple too? You remember what happened to your list for Timothy? You remember my persecutions? Timothy, you want to be a disciple? And Timothy said yes. Looking at the battered, bleeding, broken body of Paul, who as a disciple of the Lord Jesus exposed himself to such wrath and anger. You want to be a disciple? Yes, I do. You know, there are fair weather Christians. That is, as long as the sky is blue and the sun is shining and the grass is green and God is doing everything for me that's nice. Why not be a Christian? But the moment it starts to get tough, the moment things seem to go wrong, the moment there are things which I do not like, we get angry at God. So I love about Job. Job, you remember, who lost everything, a victim of satanic attack. He lost his business. He lost his children. And it says that he fell on his face and worshipped. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. What happens to me is not my reason for trusting God. And Timothy knew right from the start that there is a cost to being a true disciple. No wonder when Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, he said, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Later, he says from 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not a text that we stick on the wall. That's not a promise that we claim these days. And Timothy knew this right from the start. He knew that surrender to Jesus Christ, as he'd seen in Paul, might mean opposition, it might mean persecution, it might mean trouble, it might mean being left bleeding on the ground, assumed to be dead. It might mean that. It doesn't have to mean that. There's no virtue in suffering for its own sake. But if you're going to be my disciple, is the invitation of Jesus Christ. As we saw last week, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, whatever that means. And when Paul explained in Lystra what conversion really is, and Timothy heard it from Paul on that first visit, this is what he said to them. And this is in a nutshell, Acts 14, 15. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. Notice that there's a turning from these worthless things. And there's a turning to. Now, sometimes we are happy about the turning from. We, we like the benefit and convenience of a cleansed conscience. We like the fact that we are justified before God, meaning that we no longer stand responsible for those things which Christ has borne in our place. And we love the freedom of that. We turn from. But there's a turning to God. And the turning to God that Paul talked about there is one in full surrender, that may involve cost. 
And every generation has to face this. You know, there's a tendency that every generation tries to weaken the gospel that they heard. And that in turn becomes weakened again. But a weak gospel produces a weak church. And a weak church preaches an even weaker gospel. And an even weaker gospel produces an even weaker church until you look around and it's non-existent anymore. You know, in the last decades, there have been churches closing throughout Toronto where buildings still exist, but the people inside are not enough to sustain the cost of the building, and they're closing down. Why? Because we've lost the gospel. In my country of Great Britain, all over Britain, there are church buildings, as were, that have now become furniture stores, or converted into warehouses, or homes, or restaurants. And in fact, I was reading a British paper this last week. And uh, there was an article on the number of churches closing down in Britain. And a government minister commenting on this. And here's the report. I quote part of the report. It says, empty churches should be turned into gyms, bars, restaurants, for multi-faith centers, a government minister said last week. While it is important to preserve the architectural beauty of some churches, they may better serve the community by becoming secular buildings, he said. This is the government, a uh, representative of the government, commenting on the fact that our gospel has become so weakened and so pathetic and nobody wants it anymore. Of course they don't. It's so a weak gospel that produces empty churches. It's a strong gospel that produces strong churches. Don't ever worry about turning people away by the demands of discipleship that we have in the New Testament. We will lose some, of course, but we'll lose the chaff, not the wheat. And Jesus was never afraid to lose potential disciples. Sometimes, I am shortly embarrassment of his own disciples. Remember that occasion when he was coming out of Jericho? And there was a rich young man, one gospel tells us he was a ruler, so we call him the rich young ruler. It says he ran to Jesus, obviously broke through the crowd, and fell on his knees in front of Jesus and asked the most brilliant question, Good Master, what must I do to receive eternal life? I'm sure the crowd who were there, and the disciples in particular, thought, Boy, this guy really means business. Fantastic. And Jesus said, what about the commandments? He said, which? Jesus began to recite them. He'd got about halfway through and the man interrupted and said, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And then Jesus said, you're a rich man. Take your possessions, sell them, and give the proceeds away to the poor. And it says the man went away very sad. Because he had great wealth. Sad. What did Jesus do? Did he run after him and say, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to frighten you like that. I'm sorry. Come back, come back. Let's talk about this. You want to go to heaven, is that right? You do? Okay. Let's see. Would you like to have your sins forgiven? You haven't got many by the sound of it. You say you kept those laws. I don't actually believe you, but would you like to have your sins forgiven? You would? Okay. Now... You're a rich man, is that right? Would you like me to tell you how to spend your money? No, you've got your plans already? Okay, no, don't get uptight about that. We'll, we'll leave that one out. Uh, are you single? Would you like me to lead you as to who you should marry? Big one. What's her name, do you say? Well, maybe she doesn't have a name. You know, maybe I, I want you to stay single. The point is not what's her name. The point is, do you want my will or yours? You can handle that. Okay, fine. If you get stuck, you can always come and pray and we'll try and help you, but we'll leave that to you. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost, after I've ascended, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. My Father will send the Holy Spirit to fill my disciples. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. What's that? As long as nothing funny happens? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, just keep your mouth shut and keep your hands in your pocket and we'll, we'll keep it calm for you. 
Well, by the look of this list here, you, you, you really want your sins forgiven to go to heaven when you die. Is that right? It is right. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. That's great. I'm so glad you know that you need that. Let me leave you in a little prayer. Welcome to the family. I warn you, though, later you probably will want to come back and get rededicated because this really isn't going to be as satisfying as it should be. But anyway, at least if you get hit by a camel tomorrow, you'll know where you're going. Is that what Jesus said? Of course it wasn't. That's the popular gospel. We may not say it quite as bluntly as that. But we say, hey folks, you've got need. Here's a great need meter. He'll forgive you, cleanse your conscience, take it home when you die, fix your problems. If you get sick, don't worry, he'll fix it. And we wonder why it is we have so few disciples. You see, we cannot be a disciple on our own terms. We cannot come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want to be a disciple, and this is what I'm willing to give. Is that okay? I'm flying from Toronto to Frankfurt, from Frankfurt to Tel Aviv tonight. If I go to the airport and go up to the check-in desk of Lufthansa and say, look, I, I want to give Tel Aviv on Lufthansa. Uh, I think your fares are ridiculous. Um, what I've done is I've, I've written a ticket here of my own, and I'll give you a little money, of course. I'll give you a hundred dollars. So that's fine. And uh, just let me on with that. Do you think they would? I can always try it and see, <laughs> but I doubt it. Of course they will. But we come to Jesus. Okay, you're offering what I need. You're going to the destination I want to go to. Okay, I'd like that. I really would like that. I'm not willing to pay full price. I, I'd like to offer you a kind of cut price. And it's possible to become a pseudo-disciple, which is to become a disciple on our own terms. And you know, Jesus, as I said just now, didn't bend over backwards to keep people. In fact, he let people go. In John 6, 66, he talked about discipleship. And it says, from this time, many of his disciples, notice, they were already his disciples, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Notice that. Very interesting. There were those who already were his disciples, and they said to themselves, man, this is far bigger than I ever thought. I don't want this. And they turned back. Which is why, of course, if you preach a full gospel, you will lose Christians. And Jesus did already. But don't run after them. And then he said to his disciples, You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Peter, James, Andrew, John, James the Younger, Thaddeus, Judas, Thomas, you want to go? If you do, go. But if you stay, you stay on my terms. And Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. When Jesus gave an invitation to discipleship, he opened the back door as well as the front door. You're welcome to come in, and you're equally free to go out. And many walked no more with him. You see, the true gospel is a costly gospel. Not costly in terms of earning anything. We earn nothing in terms of what the issues of discipleship are, which are a full, unconditional surrender. That's a full gospel. That's a strong gospel. Martin Luther, the catalyst of the, Re of the Reformation, said a Christianity that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. And he was writing that from his own context.
and his own observation. And Timothy, right from the start, knew that this discipleship is costly. As a young man, he had been with a battered, bruised, broken, bleeding Paul. He knew, as Paul says, you remember what happened to me at Lystra. You remember the persecutions I endured. Timothy, you remember that is when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you knew right from the start this may be very costly business. I repeat, there's no virtue in suffering in itself. It's just the willingness that I'm now available to God. If that involves suffering, then so be it. And sometimes in a sincere attempt to bring people to Christ, we cushion all of that and we play it all down. Probably with the intention, well, let's just deal with the fundamentals. Okay, come to Jesus, be forgiven, and then afterwards we can deal with these other issues. And I know Jesus dealt with people differently. Of course, when he dealt with the woman of Samaria, he didn't talk about these issues When he met with Nicodemus, he didn't talk about these issues. He met them at the point of their need. But all these issues are inclusive within the gospel. But I feel that sometimes when we attempt to explain the gospel in a way that is palatable, attractive, and of course the gospel is attractive, because it's all about knowing Christ, and that's what makes it attractive, and being reconciled to God. But sometimes it's as though we are... We are advertising a Caribbean cruise and we tell people that there's this great cruise coming up that you can go on if you want to. And there's great food uh, on this cruise. And you visit some wonderful places and there's lots to do. There's six swimming pools on deck. There's lots of entertainment every night. And the best part about it all is that it's free. And so people sign up. Of course they do. I get phone calls from people saying, did you know you've won a free cruise on the Caribbean? I said, I think that's highly unlikely. Thank you for taking the time to tell me, though. What's the catch? Oh, no, there's no catch. Of course there's a catch. Bye. (laughs) And so they say, let's go on this Caribbean cruise. And they go down to the dock. And they look for this big white ship with a beautiful name, Caribbean Princess, along the side. And there's no big white ship there. There's just a big, dirty gray ship. There's no name, Caribbean Princess. There's just a big number on the side. There's no swimming pools on the deck. There are guns on the deck and they discover they've joined the Navy and they've been tricked. (laughs) That's what we do with the gospel sometimes. Okay, of course, the gospel is attractive and appealing and meets us at the point of need. But my response to that is more than just when my needs are being met. And Jesus is the wonderful provider of my needs, but it involves a surrender of all that I am. And if that's going to involve suffering as it did for Paul, as Timothy is encouraged to be ready for that, we live in a country where we celebrate the freedoms and we're so grateful for the freedom we have to live the Christian life and preach the gospel. But the danger with that is that we become complacent with that. Now, it's true, discipleship is full of positives as well as what may sound like negatives. You know, we saw last week in Matthew 16 when Jesus said, If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross. All that sounds negative. Then he says, Whoever loses his life for me will find it. As you lose your life, as you give your life away to Jesus Christ, as I said last week, Jesus Christ will give his life away to you and you find life in all its fullness. This is not some sentimental, quote, faith journey, end quote, that's about my own fulfillment. This is denying myself, dying to myself, and losing my life that Jesus Christ might take it and I find fulfillment in his working in us and through us. That's why Paul could say, I'd like to depart and be with Christ. He said this to Philippians, I'd be better by far, but to stay in the body is more needful on your account. 
To live is Christ, to die is gain. He says, either way, I win. Yes, it's costly. He was writing that from a Roman prison, deprived of his freedom. But to live is Christ, even though it looks costly and is costly. It's also deeply satisfying. And this is not a superversion of being a disciple. And by the way, the word Christian was a nickname given to disciples in Antioch. It says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now we tend to say there's two categories. There's a Christian and a disciple, the same thing. No, there's a Christian, which is kind of down here somewhere. There's a disciple, which is kind of fanatical up here somewhere. But this discipleship is actually normality, according to the New Testament. It's not a super deluxe version. It's normality. Watchman Nee wrote, The average Christian life is so subnormal that the normal Christian life appears to be abnormal. But normality... Is Jesus saying to this rich young ruler, sell your possessions, give them away to the poor, not because it's wrong to be rich. Of course it's not wrong to be rich. But no man can serve two masters. He loved the one, hate the other. You cannot serve God on mammon or money or materialism. Those words are used in, in, in different translations. And he was saying, your problem is you've already got a master. So get rid of your master, then follow me. And because he, Jesus obviously diagnosed him rightly, he said, no, that's, that's the very thing I cannot let go of. And he went away sad. Why sad? Because I actually want eternal life. I really want it. I came running. I fell on my knees in full view of the crowd. But this is my master. I can't let it go. And Jesus said, okay. Goodbye. See, this is normal Christian living. And we have to be interested in true New Testament discipleship. And we're going to pick this up next time and look at Timothy, because Timothy, despite this coming to Christ in such a dramatic context, this occasion when Paul had been left for dead, and whether he, Paul went back to his home or not, it was in that context that Timothy seemingly was converted. Paul had to write to Timothy years later and, and, and say, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Because Timothy, you're a little timid. He suggests that several times to him. Fan into flame, stir up the gift in you, Timothy, you're a little timid. You know, starting well means you need encouragement all the way along the line. Timothy needed that, and we're going to see that. But I ask you as I finish this morning, what is the quality of your discipleship? Of course, you're not perfect. Nobody is. Timothy wasn't. Paul wasn't. Nobody is. But what's the state of your heart towards God? Is it a conditional surrender? I will surrender, provided I keep, like the rich young ruler, I'll keep what is mine. You can have the rest. Or is it an unconditional surrender? Not a cost we pay for our salvation, but the exchange that is necessary in true repentance. True repentance, I'm just saying, I'm sorry for what I've done. True repentance is turning from what I am and all that is part of me to God and all that He is. And I ask this question too of some of us this morning. Are you truly born again? The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God says Paul. Is that the kind of spiritual life you have? It's a life as opposed to simply a belief. And you're trying to follow this thing. But it's pushing a bus up a hill. Or is there life? And that life has appetites. And this word is where your appetite is fed. Or if you've maybe been a disciple, but the cost is such that you've been compromising and turning from Christ to do your own thing. You've been one of those that walked no more with Him. You need to come back. You can still be in church every week and not be walking with Jesus. But your life has surrendered. If we want to understand what any church is about, any biblical church is about, we have to understand what discipleship is about because the church has one job description. Make disciples. That's what we're here for this morning. Anything less than that is fraudulent to the purposes of Jesus Christ. To make disciples who love Him and trust Him and obey Him.
and live for Him and whose lives are surrendered in every part. And there's actually no life that is more exciting than that. Because somebody bigger than you is in charge. Somebody bigger than you anticipates every turn on the road and through it all works out his purpose. And we may be bruised and broken and bleeding like Paul. Maybe not physically, emotionally. We have laws about that in this country, so maybe not physically, but emotionally. Or tension-wise. We're in a family context where Christ is not left. We're in a workplace where you're alone as a believer. You say, Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in this place at this time. That you and me can be showing yourself. Thank you for joining Charles Price on Living Truth. Next week, join Charles Price for part two of this series, The Growth of a Disciple, Timothy's Consecration. 